All right, folks, welcome back to Switch on Sundays. Uh, if you haven't been here before, uh, there are a few basic rules to go over just quickly. Uh, first, uh, there is an open chat area, as you can see in your YouTube thing. Please go ahead and ask me questions there as we progress. Uh, I do prefer to answer them as we go, otherwise uh, it gets very, very confusing at the end. Um, if you have questions more generally around uh, iOS development, they're welcome too, but perhaps keep those until the very end. Otherwise, it'll be uh, confusing everybody else. So uh, if you can keep it topical, join the stream, that'd be helpful. Um, once again, I'll repeat the basic rule that I don't accept any sort of harassment. So if you uh, insist on being mean to folks or whatever, I will boot you, I will ban you permanently. I have absolutely zero tolerance for any kind of behavior, abuse or whatever. Uh, so, uh, Please, please don't be that kind of person. You're not welcome here, basically. So uh, that's the long and short of it. <laughs> um, this time, though, we've got a particular topic to cover. Um, you know I like to make apps in Swift on Sundays and actual real development of real stuff. Um, but uh, this time, I want to focus on one particular area of app development, which is unit testing, uh, writing tests for your software. Now, I still want to write an app with you, um, but we'll focus around, you know, the, the usual style of these things is, you know, I, I write a, a fairly um, like a naive solution to the problem, right? I whiz through it real quick, I get it right, and it kind of works, and then we refine it over a period of time. That's the way I approach these sessions. Um, but this time, because our focus really is uh, to look at unit testing, all our refinements will be about unit testing. So, you know, we'll look at the app we've written, how uh, you can make it more testable over time and similar. So it's testing heavy, uh, but again, we're gonna start off by uh, um, making an actual app, right? Not a hard one, a simple one, because the focus is testing, but still I want you to see the app we've made and the reasons why I follow certain instructions and so forth. Um, so that's the goal. Now, usually we aim for about an hour. So it is like five past six or so, uh, and my goal is to finish about seven. Uh, usually, <laughs> often we run over, but I do aim to finish after an hour or so, that's my goal. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, just crack on with some stuff here. Now uh, this time the app we're going to build uh, is going to be a a simple uh, game slash not really a game edutainment uh, app for people to learn uh, basic mathematics. So adding and subtracting and multiplying, uh, and we're going to do this thing using something we haven't done before. Um, I'm going to share my screen in Xcode. You can see what I'm going to do. Otherwise, it'll be very confusing. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and uh, go to File, New, Project. I'm going to choose this time a macOS project um, because this time we're going to make a macOS command line tool as opposed to a regular iOS app. Uh, and the reason for that is when we're looking at testing, uh, it's easier to teach when you've got very, very fast turnarounds. So when you can say, make a change, test, make a change, test, and so forth. Uh, and as much as I love the iOS and the simulator, uh, right now it does require installing that into the simulator, so it's a bit slower. Uh, we are gonna write in pure Swift though. There's no like Mac OS code in here for you to worry about. This is gonna be pure Swift code. Uh, there's no worries about it not being applicable. It's all, all good Swift code in iOS and Mac OS. It's just much faster for our purposes to use a command line tool. So I'll choose command line tool. Uh, and uh, this thing, you can quickly want to, uh, I'm gonna call my thing, I multiply. I multiply and put it on my desktop. Uh, now, if you haven't built a Mac OS command line tool before, there's not much to them. Uh, there's just literally a file called main.swift. Uh, question, will it work on Linux? Yes, it should work great on Linux. It should, if you wanna follow on Linux, you're welcome to, you'd be, you'd be the first, <laughs> but you're welcome to follow on Linux. Good question. Uh, you get one file called um, uh, main.swift, which contains your code. And the name main.swift matters. It becomes an executable command line program, and you call it main, as opposed to some class name, for example. So main matters. Uh, and we're going to start off by defining the kind of questions our application is going to be able to deal with. Uh, we only have three of them. Uh, so we're going to say there is some sort of question type. And it will either be add, or it will be subtract, or it will be multiply. Easy enough, right? Those are our three cases. 
Now, to start with, again, we're having a very uh, naive implementation here. We're going for a very simple solution so we can get onto the testing part relatively quickly. Uh, in our thing, we're going to find, define a game class called iMultiply and then say, you're going to have a question number between 1 and 10. It goes up, you're trying to answer a question. There'll be a score, track how many you got right or wrong. And a big start method saying, right, take over control and don't return until you're finished. It's a game loop. It will loop infinitely while the game's still running along. So I'll say, uh, there is a class called, now, I thought about this, I want to call this thing, my brain's saying, call this thing, I multiply. But that breaks all sorts of rules. You know, you could, should really call this thing, I multiply, the capital I. But it looks wrong. It looks deeply wrong. So I'm going to just say, to hell with convention, and, and use a lowercase i here, because aesthetics is, is uh, so important. <laughs> uh, I'm try and make this Xcode window slightly bigger, so you can see more. Someone said last time they wished the chat window could be smaller. Um, that is as small as the chat window goes, I believe. It cannot go as bigger, but not any smaller. So uh, I'm afraid we are stuck with that size chat window to that commenter. Anyway, uh, we'll say there's an iMultiply class defining sort of our game that we're going to start and run. Uh, so I'm going to say this thing has a property called question number, which is going to be equal to one, the question number the person is on, and a score for the player how many they've got correct, and of course that will start at zero. Plus a method. And when this method's called, it's going to take over control of the game. When we, it's not going to return until the game's finished or the user quits. And we'll call this thing start. And inside there, we'll do a little print. Welcome to I multiply. Because, you know, UI matters. Then we'll add a repeat while loop. Someone said last week I should use repeat while. I think it was last week. And they were right, but of course I didn't think of it at the time. So this time I've, I've specifically used repeat while for that person. If you're in the chat, say hello. I'm using repeat while just for you. Uh, repeat while uh, question number is less than 10. There you go. Just to keep that person happy. I'm going to say print uh, at the end of the loop. New line, you scored, some score number. And then the, the whole thing ends. So that's our, our start method. Print a message, repeat this code while we haven't asked 10 questions yet. When that finishes, break the loop and then just print out the score number. So that's our loop. Easy enough. Uh, and to kick that off, of course, we want to say, uh, make an instance of this. We'll say let game equals a new i multiply and then game.start. And that kicks off a game loop and goes. And that is, of course, the easy part, right? That's just setting up our structures and initial values and saying go, but uh, it doesn't do any actual work there. Um, EJ, uh, never heard of repeat while. You should follow the Swift 100 days. Or even better, sorry, the 100 days of Swift. Um, hacking with Swift.com slash 100 um, because it's covered in there. Anyway. That's the easy part, right? We've just said <laughs> make, a, make a structure and call start and repeat forever. Um, that's a trivial part. The actual work here, the work of our, our incredible game, uh, is to um, pick out some numbers each time you go around the loop, saying, you know, 5 and 11, for example. Pick out an operator. Is it add, subtract, or multiply? Uh, create a question string. What is 5 times 8, for example? Uh, read the user's input, uh, input from the keyboard. They typed in 15. Um, compare the two. If they're correct, add one to score. Uh, and add one to question number. Um, so that is sort of the, the goal of this thing. Um, that's the actual work. And that all sort of happens inside this repeat block here. So we're going to go ahead and code that down. And again, this is totally naive, but I want you to see it because it'll make more sense when we start refactoring it. We'll start, well, not refactoring, we'll start rewriting it, pulling it apart into, into testable things. Um, question from ROL, is it too late to start the 100 days? No, it's not. It's not. You can start on your own schedule. As long as you have 100 days dedicated to writing, to following the, the curriculum at the site, um, perhaps someone posts a link to it in the chat, it'd be helpful. Um, an hour a day, follow that on your own schedule, you'll be fine. You don't have to, you have to follow along with anybody else, just do it your own time. An hour a day, that's all that matters. Okay, so inside our repeat loop, we're going to start off by saying, uh, give us two operands to work with. Uh, saying there are no assets for this game. It's all in code. It's not very exciting. It's all about testing, really. It's the simplest possible app I can think of that's interesting to test. <laughs> anyway. Ah, thank you, Franklin, for the link. I will show. It goes in. Boom. There's a link. Click on that. Check it out. Anyway. 
Step, step one, get two operands. I'm going to say the left operand equals int dot random, random in 1 through 12. Uh, the, the 100 days of Swift are going to be there forever and ever and ever, all being well, at least until I give up Swift, which will be a long time yet, trust me. Um, so uh, it'll be there for a long time. So left and right, our two operands are random numbers between 1 and 12, inclusive on both ends. We also want to pull out a random operation. Is it add? Is it subtract? Is it multiply? And to do that, we're going to make our enum conform to a wonderful protocol um, from Robert Widman called case iterable, which makes uh, or synthesizes a property on there called all cases. So when we now say in here, question type uh, dot all cases, you'll see as an array of question type comes back. And that is that will contain add, subtract, multiply in the order we have them in our enum. So we can actually reuse that to make our random uh, operand operator. Sorry. So we'll say let uh, the operation to perform is question types dot all cases dot random element, and I'm going to force unwrap that. Uh, and this is one of those many places where I'm absolutely comfortable doing a force unwrap because if our if our enum is empty. Clearly, something's gone wrong in our code. It cannot be changed at runtime to a different enum. Uh, so I'm quite comfortable doing that. And there is no sensible way of providing an optional there. You couldn't do like, you know, nil coalescing uh, question type dot add because that doesn't exist. The enum's empty. So there is, there is no sensible way of default value there. It's got to be forced unwrapped. So that's our left operand, our right operand, plus the operation in the middle. What we're going to do to these two things. Uh, now I want to say, what's the actual user-facing question we want them to answer? Uh, you know, what's the actual text we want them to look at? So we're going to say, uh, let question as a string. Oops, string, not a staring. String. And we'll say, uh, switch operation. Case is add. Question equals, what is string interpolation? Left plus interpolation right that is our question right there case iterable for leap was added in swift 4.2 it's fairly new actually but it's quite beautiful uh, at add that is subtract and we'll do multiply so we'll handle each of our cases as three different strings uh, what is left minus right and what is left multiplied multiplied by right Yard man, can I have a swift deb job? I do the 100 days of code. Probably not. Probably not. You're a, you're a lot better from where you would have been, but you're probably not quite good enough to get a good junior job. Depends on the company, how friendly they are. Uh, ROL streaming ideally for an hour, but I don't time these things ahead of time. So it could be half an hour. If I get through really fast, it could be an hour and a half, but I suspect this will be a shorter one. Anyway, so we've now got uh, our strings being created correctly from whichever operation was chosen from our array, array of enums. So we have our left and our right and our operation and our string. The next step is to figure out uh, int has no ever random. It ought to. It ought to. I press build. Yep, it looks fine to me. Maybe I have build warnings turned off perhaps. I often turn off build warnings so I'm a bit of a, a numpty in that respect. There we go, let's show live issues. That would make things significantly easier for you to follow along. Uh, if you haven't got int.random in, you're probably not using Swift 4.2. You're probably using Swift 4.1 which would be a bad and confusing choice at this point. Anyway, two operands, operation to work with, text string to ask the user. Let's now calculate the answer. We'll do let correct answer is an int of some sort. Uh, switch operation again, we've got case add. In this case, the correct answer equals left plus right. And then case dot subtract. Correct answer equals left minus right. And then case multiply. Correct answer equals left times right. Boom. So that tells us, again, the next step is the correct answer to work with. At this point, we have all the information required to proceed with asking our user the question. We know what to ask them. We know what to expect back. So we can say, uh, let's print out a line break followed by string interpolation, the, qu the question number, then a full stop or a period, depending on where you're from, and then the question string. So it'll say one dot, what is five times five? Two dot, 
what is 3 minus 2 and similar and then we're going to ask them to tell us their answer by using print again by saying your answer colon but then with a space and a quote we're going to use the terminator argument not the uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger argument the terminator argument um, to put it in there as an empty string because by default terminator is a, a line break and so print will add a line break after itself if we use an empty string for terminator um, it means it will just show the, uh, ne the user input area next to the current print statement rather than having a line break question from manuel martin why not use just one switch operation because i'll be pulling apart shortly and it'd be very confusing to follow if i used one combined switch i am planning ahead slightly just slightly just enough to get through this <laughs> okay so we've shown the question we've asked them to input their answer now for the important stuff we want to read in what they think the answer is so we're going to say uh if let answer equals read line now read line is available to us on the command line it means just read one line of input from the terminal it returns an optional string because the user might, uh, you know, command C to kill the input uh, and effectively kill the program, or command D actually. Um, so it, it returns optional string, hence why I'm doing an optional unwrap here carefully. So read one of my text in, then we're going to attempt to convert that into an integer by saying guard let answer int equals int answer. And if that fails, if they, if they typed in fish or something, uh, then that's not a valid answer. We don't want to work with that. We're going to print out the word error and continue. Just go through the loop again. Ask a fresh question again and again until the answer sensibly. Question, will I tell you the code somewhere? Yes, I will. There's a GitHub repo. Perhaps uh, a kind soul could link it in the chat for me. There's a GitHub repo on Two Straws Swift on Sundays to uh, check out all the code from the previous week plus this week when I finish it. So if they've entered a non-valid integer, fish, whatever, in there, we just print an error and try again. Otherwise, we're going to add one up to question number. They've answered at least one number correctly, got question two and so forth. And then compare their answer against our correct answer. And if they were correct, if they typed in the correct number, we're going to say score plus equals one and print correct. Thank you very much, Neil. Boom. Uh, print correct with a C, second C. Uh, else we will print wrong. It's not two stars, it's two straws. That's my GitHub handle, sorry. <laughs> uh, print wrong. Print correct or print wrong. Uh, and that, I think, more or less, is our game. I mean, that is what, 77 lines plus line breaks and some comments at the top. Not a lot going on there. Uh, it's pretty simple. I think as I've screwed something up, that should be our game. I'll press build. It looks good. No warnings, no errors. Now it's a command line app, and I find these easiest to test on the actual command line. So you want, what you want to do is go to Xcode and just drag the I multiply binary from Xcode into the command line like that. And it'll basically paste the path into the command line. And if you press return now, it'll tell you it'll run the code straight away. It asks me what is 4 multiplied by 12. Of course, the answer is 48. Boom, that's correct. Uh, what is 10 multiplied by 5? I'm going to say it is 40. Should be wrong. Excellent. And um, what is 12 plus 10? I'm going to say the answer is fish. Should be error. Okay, so correct, wrong, and error all seems to work correctly. We've got an add question here. I'm going to say 21, uh, 8 minus 4, minus great, 4, and so forth, 2. So it all seems to work very, very nicely at this point, which is great. So, phew, <laughs> that in only like 15 minutes quite frankly uh was our program done that's we're done we can go home right <laughs> no and this is it's done right it's done but it's done naively this is not in any way uh testable uh if i go back to the code again you'll see actually it's a bit nightmarish in terms of its testability uh so if i can put a terminal at the bottom perhaps because it might let us see both at the same time you can run the program straight through xcode if you want to but i find it a bit harder to control personally there we go so this is our current program it all works correctly but this is extraordinarily hard to test you know basically all the work happens in this one epic method called start which is 
several screens long. You know, when you have to scroll through a method, you know you've done something wrong sometimes because it's just doing too much work. And it accepts no input, so we can't control it. It accepts, well, it gives us pretty gnarly output, you know, all these print statements. So we can't really test that. If you want to write like a standard output reader to read the output again and again and again, it's pretty nasty, right? If we're going to write tests for this, we've got to pull this thing apart into much more simpler things, like little units we can write tests for more easily. Here's a function with one input or one output, or two inputs and one output, whatever. We can just test and control in a sandbox much more easily. So um, this is actually, I think, a fairly nice uh, application to, to learn testing with because it's simple, because there isn't a lot going on here. You can start to get an idea of, you know, well, I could test that, I could test that and so forth. How many tests could you feasibly write for this that's still actually, you know, unique and useful? We don't go by volume of tests, ideally. Um, but anyway, it's a great camera for the stream because we need to really pull it apart into things we can control more easily. Now, cunningly, um, for some unknown reason, uh, Xcode makes unit testing of uh, macOS command line apps hard. And I don't really know why. When you make, if I make a new iOS project, uh, or even a Cocoa project for macOS, uh, you'll see include unit testers there and check because I normally include in my projects. Um, but if you make a command line app, you don't get that. You just get told, you know, do it yourself. So if I go to the command line app again, um, oops, Mac OS command line tool, no options whatsoever. They really make it hard to make this thing testable, uh, which is of course a joy. Uh, so instead, we've got to do it by hand. We've got to tell Xcode to do all that work ourselves. So we'll start off by going to the file menu and go to new and target. I'm going to search for test and choose a macOS unit testing bundle. Boom. I'll call this thing uh, iMultiply tests. Uh, you'll see there's a nice box here saying target to be tested. And on iOS and macOS, that box works great. You can click on none and choose your app there and it works. But you can see my app's grayed out. It's like, you know, sorry, we, we totally can't test those things. No idea what that means, sorry. Um, so we can't use that. So leave it at none, enter a name and then press finish, which kind of sucks. And then make a little tests file again, uh, but it's not great because it doesn't actually work. Uh, what you'll see is, in fact, if I go to the target settings, you'll see it has host application here, still set to none. And this checkbox below, if you can make it on the stream, maybe just about um, allow testing host application APIs, that's the one that does all the magic. Uh, Nico van der Linden, you want unit tests. Uh, UI tests are a whole other different thing and they would not work terribly well with a command line app like this one. Anyway, that allow testing host application APIs is what does the magic for us in iOS and macOS. Let's our um, uh, tests talk to our project code, our production code smoothly and easily. We cannot check that here. We can't set the host application here and so forth. Um, so it, it's rubbish, right? We can't do it at all. Again, got to do it by hand, which isn't ideal. So instead, what we've got to do is kind of tell it that main.swift, we want that to be in our test target. We want this file here to be available not only in iMultiply itself, but also in the tests. And you wouldn't normally do that. Again, you just check that box in the, the settings normally. But here we can't do that because it's a command line app. We're going to add it by hand as a target to our testing target. So that creates test target, adds in our code so we can start testing it and so forth. We also need to add an important line to our test case file saying at testable import iMultiply. Now the at testable attribute is an important one and it means that things we wouldn't normally have access to are now ours to fiddle around with. In particular, you know, the, the test is, is a separate module in Swift's land. I multiply has its own internal classes, its own internal stuff that normally it wouldn't be able to poke around with. But when we use, use at testable, we can create those structs, we can create those enums, we can create, uh, call those methods and so forth, even though they were internal to iMultiply, at testable magically makes them available to us. So we can uh, start poking around with them more freely. So you'll nearly always want to use at testable like that. The last thing to do, again, random Xcode annoyance thanks to command line apps, but it's trivial enough. Hold down the option key, go to product and choose test. 
to manage the test scheme in Xcode. Because you'll see by default, there are no test targets here, uh, which is uh, problematic. Kabir, uh, question, why don't you refactor the class into a static library? That's a very interesting question. It's a very important thing to want to do. Um, it's not the point of the Sunday thing. You, you ask those questions quite a lot, Kabir. I try and focus on one thing at a time, otherwise it becomes problematic. I haven't got a four hour, five hour stream planned each week. I wanna do one thing at a time, otherwise it'll just go out of control. Uh, Andrea, that's a very important question. Who needs testing? Let's cover that at the very end. Let's try and stay focused on the uh, uh, current task in hand, which is writing these tests for the current program. And then we'll look at the more general things at the end after I finish the testing. Anyway, as I was saying, in our test scheme, you can see there's no test target in there. We've got to click plus by hand, choose our tests and press add in order to have them actually run by Xcode. I mean, it's just silly. These are things we shouldn't have to do, but we do. Uh, and that is sadly the downside of using the command line app in Mac OS. Even though it's really fast to test with, it does mean doing more work by ourselves, which sucks. Anyway, that is the configuration nonsense covered. We're done. Let's now look at how bad our code is for testing. We've got these example tests here, test example and test performance example. And I should say, by the way, that for so many projects I have seen, these are the only two tests in the app. Um, potentially Andrea's projects, who's asking why do testing. Um, these are the only tests they have, test example and test performance example. So they don't write tests, which is a real shame. Um, we're gonna hijack test example temporarily. And we'll use this thing to just see how bad our current code actually is, because it's really bad. I'm going to say, let game equals I multiply, multiply, game dot start. I've got, I've got a dash there by accident. That should be an equals, sorry. Boom. Create an instance of our game and start it. And I'm going to press play. And that's going to build and run our test target and run it through. And when it runs, it will launch an I multiply instance and start it and so forth. And all being well, we'll see, boom, in our output, what is two multiplied by five? Your answer, L line. And it's like, you gotta type in, you know, 10 or something, right? You wanna actually play the game in the command line output. There's no way of handling the input and output for it and checking the input and output and controlling the input and output. Um, so this is actually pretty awful, right? We need much more fine grain control than that. Uh, and, and again, like, I, you know, I like doing this in every, every week. When we start to refine our code, uh, I always like to start small, you know, get some quick wins moving. That's one of my personal approaches to productivity is I, I love going for quick wins. Because when I start getting some wins behind me, I get, you know, momentum, I get some velocity in the right direction. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting somewhere. I feel more able to tackle the big things. So I like going for small things and then getting some speed up, you know. So we're going to start carving off stuff so we can start testing them. And in particular, let's look at our code again. You can see, let's just go linearly through this thing. We, we start our repeat loop here and we immediately create a left side and a right side and an operation. That is the way we are creating questions right now. Um, the easiest thing to do is to get that code out of there into a new struct called, you know, question or something that creates this for us. So we can say, create a question, did it correctly make numbers between one and 12? You know, what if someone changes the feature to have 120 by accident, they, you know, they fat finger a zero in here. We would catch that on our tests by saying, make sure both operands are within the boundaries we expect them to be. So I'm gonna go ahead and snag these lines of code. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, take them out actually for now. And I'll put them up here into a new struct. You can make a new file if you want to, you don't have to. This is a simpler program. I'll do struct question and paste them in there like that. Uh, now, what you want to do really is have those inside an initializer um, because we want this thing to make itself automatically. I don't like, particularly like adding them directly into the uh, struct like that only because it makes them hard to change by hand later on to control. Uh, a better idea is to have like a far left int, far right int, uh, var operation is going to be some sort of question type. Then have an initializer here where we set those values when the thing is being made. Boom. 
So we're overriding the default member-wise initializer of these structs to have our own initializer. When you create a question by itself, you'll get back a left value, a right value, and an operation like that. Uh, now, it's going to complain bitterly because I haven't uh, updated the code so that's going to work yet. Um, but we can start modifying it if I have like a, let's say, let question equals uh, a new question. And we'll do uh, question dot operation. This needs to be uh, let question string. To make the code compile again, basically. That goes in here. Question string, question string, question string. Uh, question dot left. Da -da, left, left. Uh, then right, then right, then right. Then operation. Ah, you know what? I'm gonna be lazy. I'm gonna be lazy. I'm, it's, it feels wrong, but I'm gonna be super lazy. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat slightly here. And as we take code out, we're also gonna leave it in. So if I leave that if initializer here, as we had it, I'll copy that to my clipboard, undo back to the earlier version where I took the question out of the code, out of the loop code, like that, uh, exactly as it was effectively, and then paste that back in there. We'll, we'll 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 modify it slowly piece by piece rather than doing it all at once. It's gonna make more sense this way, I think. So I've got the same same struct I had, the same initializer here, but I've put the old code of having it in line inside the repeat method here. So nothing else has changed. So you can see exactly the code, the code hasn't changed realistically. But we can now at least write a test for this. We can say create a question instance. Even though this repeat block doesn't use it yet, it will use it real soon now. So uh, I'll, I'll test this thing. I'll go to here and say uh, let's ditch that example test. Ditch performance test. Uh, let's say uh, func test question operands operands within bounds. Uh, let question equals question, and then xet assert greater than or equals to uh, question dot left one. Was it at least one on the left hand side? Now. Many people, including me normally, would prefer to um, prefer to have this thing. Uh, Josh, your question, your, your nitpick has actually thrown me off slightly. Thank you uh, for that. <laughs> um, many folks prefer to have exactly one assertion per test, which is fine. I am totally cool with that. In this instance, having more than one is actually a bit cleaner for me. Um, so I might have a few of these. I'd say greater than or equal to left one, right one, uh, right one, then xt uh, less than or equal to question dot left uh, and 12 and right and 12. So just make sure both numbers fall within those bounds like that. So again, we've got this struct here with its own initializer. We haven't changed this code yet, and that's intentional, I think. It makes more sense this way. We'll leave it alone, change it all at the end to be correct. But we're just writing tests in the meantime. Um, uh, you can see here that we have, uh, the next piece of code after this is to say, what's our question string? What's left plus right, and so forth. Uh, so we're basically taking a question, our question struct, and formatting it as a string. So it returns you know, itself as a question to be asked to the user. So we can take that code, again, I'm not gonna copy, uh, cut it out of here, I'll just copy it out of here for the time being. And I'll paste that into our uh, question struct. I'll say var string is a string, paste. And I'll just do return rather than question equals. So send back the string form of this uh, question whenever dot string is called. And now we can, we can test that, of course, we could say, uh, we need to pass in a, a, a question and say, what is five plus five? And expect to get back the string, what is five plus five? However, this is problematic. Um, if I go to my tests file, let's say I write a test along the lines of uh, func test question string is formatted correctly. What I want to do is say, I expect to get back, uh, you know, if I have let question equals question, I expect to get back xet assert uh, equal question dot string, what is 
what is 5 multiplied by 5? I'll get that back. Uh, this is problematic because uh, our questions create themselves right now. So I could do, of course, to say var question equals question, question dot left uh, equals 5, uh, question dot right equals 5, question dot operation equals dot add. I could basically force override whatever was made for me to be exact values we expect to get back. And that should, in theory, if I type correctly, oops, failed. What did I do? Oh, add. Huh, sorry. <laughs> multiply. Multiply. There we go. Try again. I hope there's no mistakes there beyond that one. Boom, that passes. I believe that answers Manuel Martin's question. Why not use let properties instead of var in a struct? Because we want to modify them later on. Uh, that's one approach. That's not the approach I would personally use. I find that a bit unnecessary here, uh, particularly because th there are other reasons why you might want to force in particular operations or particular values. You know, you might say, let's do a lot of add questions, then some subtract, then some multiply in level three, for example. Um, what I prefer to do is have our custom initializer and our member wise initializer together at the same time. I want to say question uh, left is five, right is five, operation is dot multiply. So use, use the default member wise initializer for structs to uh, make our question rather than injecting them by hand. Uh, and we try and build that. The error we get back, of course, is that we haven't got this method anymore. This initializer doesn't exist anymore. Left five, right five, and so forth. This is no longer valid because as soon as you have your own custom initializer in a struct like this one, you lose the member wise one. You can't have it anymore. Um, because of course you might do some work in there that Swift isn't aware of. Like you take the left number and double, double it or triple it or who knows what. Um, so Swift disables its member wise initializer synthesis when you have your own one. So the right thing is to, uh, yeah, so Jeeper Luke, as I've just shown, you can't do that. That's what I was trying to say. Um, the right thing to do here is to take out this initializer. Uh, not because I don't want it, but because if you put that thing inside an extension on question, what you'll find is it now exists as initializer, but we also get to keep the memberwise initializer. So you have memberwise initializer and your custom initializer in a struct living side by side, which is a much nicer way of working. And you wouldn't otherwise have that. If you kept the init inside the struct directly, you wouldn't have the memberwise initializer. So it's a nice little workaround for situations where you know it's safe to have the memberwise plus your custom one. So we can now test that our string, uh, our question string is formatted correctly. Uh, convenience init, I think you're looking, yeah, maybe more at classes for that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, down to you. So that test checks our string is formatted correctly. The next thing you want to do is look at the answer code. If you look back at main stuff again, you'll see um, it calculates the answer down here. Boom. So here's our question string. Then has another switch, this chunk here, for doing answer stuff. So it's going to say, look at the operation. The correct answer is left plus right or left minus right or left times right, whatever it is. Um, again, the question has all the information required to know its answer. It knows its left value. It knows its right value. It knows its operation. So the question should itself be able to calculate its answer. So we will uh, rinse and repeat. We'll take this code here, switch operation, the second one. Copy that to the clipboard and add that to our question struct. So we'll say up here, our answer is an int and paste that in there and let's do return again and again and again, just like before. Boom. So now our questions are able to format their questions as text and calculate their own answers, which makes sense. They understand everything in that question knows exactly what the value should be coming out. So at this point, we've taken this code here from line 61 down to 85 is now more or less redundant. It isn't really there anymore. We can do that more simply. Let's try a test for our new code. Uh, back in our tests file, I'm going to say func test adding works. I mean, it's not ideal. Um, we'll do let question equals 
question, left is five, right is five, operation is dot add, uh, xct assert equal, question dot answer is 10. So you might say instead of adding works, test adding, uh, let's do test five plus five is 10, for example. Boom, like that, I'll press uh, test, see what it thinks of that, all being well, it'll pass. Brilliant, no uh, fundamental phase of maths just yet. And so now we have controlled our input more clearly. We can say, create a custom question, make sure the question has its correct string coming out, make sure it has the right answer coming out and so forth. Uh, we're getting sort of somewhere slowly. We can really start to rip apart this code a little bit. You know, we could take out nearly all of this stuff. Um, we could say, uh, uh, let's say, let let question equals a question. Boom. This can all go completely. This can all go completely. Boom. We're left with question number is question dot string, and answer is going to be question dot answer. I think that may may or may not work the first time. Uh, it's complete. Oh, not, not that one. Sorry. Uh, down here. Sorry, my mistake. Question dot answer. Let's try that again. This time with 100% less foolishness. Question dot answer. Yeah. Okay. Great. So we ripped out loads of code. Plus, started to write some tests along the way. You would want to write more tests than that. Clearly, you want some uh, tests to test that things that are wrong are wrong, as well as just one correct thing. Otherwise, you could just hard code five and five, for example. It'd probably work most of the time, uh, which is a bad idea. Anyway, so we're taking out lots of code, which is great. What you really want to do now is get rid of the rest of this code. There's still lots of junk in here in the start method. Fine, that's come out great. Um, the ants calculation that's come out great, but all this code in here for you know evaluating the answer is it error? Is it correct? Is it wrong? Uh, adding one to score or question number and similar, you know, there's no way of saying did we answer correctly or not. There's no way of saying we got the string correct back or score went up by one or whatever when they answered correctly or answered wrongly. Um, so this whole chunk there has already got to come out. So I'm going to um, command x that and make a new method inside our i multiply class called func process. This is going to process some sort of answer string with some sort of question and it'll return some sort of string. You know what was the result of the process? I'll just paste in all our code into there. So it's going, to, it's going to try and convert the answer string to an answer in like before. If that fails, though, it will just return error straight away for the, the caller to figure out what that actually means. If it's not wrong, it will add one to the question. It will then check if it's the actual correct answer or not. If it is, it adds one to score and will return correct or return wrong. So now it's not the responsibility of start to check answers. It's responsibility of this process method to check answers. Here's an answer. Here's the matching question. Is that correct or not? Take the appropriate action and tell me what the result was. And so in line 82 down here, we know the answer string from the command line. We can act on it. We can say we've typed in five. Call process with that answer. We'll do uh, let response equals process their answer for the question that was asked and just print the response. So print correct, print wrong, whatever, down the way. And that should build, oh, is complaining. Oh, answer, answer, comma, there we go. Building, good. This is better, and we can now at least call process inside a test. We can say, hey, here's a question, here's an answer string. Did it actually add up or not? Was it correct? Uh, so I'm gonna go back to my tests file here and say uh, func test string input works. Let question equals a question where left is five, right is five. Uh, operation is we'll do dot add. Let game equals a new instance of our i multiply class. 
let result equals game.process, the user answer was zero uh, for question. Oh, let me see a colon here, my mistake. Uh, and we expect uh, XCT assert equal, we expect the result to be equal to wrong. That's the wrong answer, because five, add five is not zero. And I'll be well, if I save that, see if that runs. Magic, okay. Let's try uh, 10. Again, you want to do more than one test case for these things, or I'm just modifying it in place, but you get the idea. Excellent. Uh, we can also write a test that, you know, uh, answering question with any sort of answer, we don't care what the actual answer was, does it correctly um, modify the question number? Does it correctly modify the score? Is the game progressing through correctly and so forth? So we could say, you know, func testering, test answering question increments counter. Let question equals, I'm going to paste this question here. <laughs> Let quit, let's take all this stuff here, there we go. So questions five, writes five, operations add, create a new game, I multiply, underscore equals uh, game dot process, answer 10, uh, for question, question, xd assert equal, game dot question number is equal to two. Have we gone to question two now? Save that, run that back. Marvellous. So it's correctly counting through the game, which is uh, a nice thing to have. So at this point, we have tests that check uh, all our questions are inside the right bounds between one and 12, like this. We have tests checking the strings being formatted correctly. There's no typos there, like this one. We have tests checking the answers are correct, like this one. We expect five plus five to equal 10. And we just added some here, testing that string input is correctly handled, and that as we answer questions in, it adds the game counter again and again and again to two, three, four, five, and so forth. So this is kind of getting better. But there's still a major problem with our app, which is that uh, our start method, what remains in our start method, which isn't very much at this point, which is, which is good, what remains in the start method is actually rather hard to test. Because, you know, it's all very well, this thing, you know, creating a question or calling process or whatever, calling our code is fine, but it calls this function here, this method here, readline, which is not ideal. Uh, that is going to uh, read command line input from the terminal. Now that's bad, not only because it's out of our control, what can be typed, we can't you know, uh, control that and force it to be certain values very easily, but it's also bad because uh, it's gonna act as a, a hidden dependency that the, we can't remove, because we wanna remove it entirely. We don't wanna have our test lock up and say, what's the answer and just wait forever and ever to type hand type stuff. We wanna remove that dependency in our tests replace it with an auto answering thing. So it will run through, you know, in a thousandth of a second, all our tests, which it won't do right now, because it basically waits for the user to type something in, which kind of sucks. Uh, now there are a few ways you can work around this. One is to make, well, the best one really is to make this hidden dependency explicit. We expect our is multiply class to have some sort of way to handle user input. And now we know that's going to be read line for production code, because that's the point of this program, enter the answers. But for tests, we're going to provide it something else. Say, hey, here's your answer, it's five, whatever it is. Um, so we want to be able to replace that at runtime. So we're going to turn this thing from a hidden dependency called you know, read line into property injection. We have a property to our class up here that we can modify at test time. We're going to have an answer here, sorry, var, answer function equals a closure that calls readline, like that. So whenever we call answer function, it will just call readline. Now I've put it inside a closure like that because readline actually has two variants. If I show you the co-completion, if I read line, you will see there is a stripping new line bool or one without. And this one without is basically this thing with a default value of true and it turns you know, 12 new line in just 12. We don't care about that. We, we don't have to worry about some random bool we don't, we don't really care about here. So I'll just call inside the closure the regular read line instead, uh, inside there. So now we can, when we are calling our game loop, you know, inside this repeat thing here, 
we don't want to call read line directly. We want to call answer function, which will uh, accept the Boolean in this case. It won't, but we took it out and return an optional string, the value of uh, read line. Question from RRL, will live streams be available after as well? Yes, they will. They are available totally after, uh, forever and ever. Much to my detriment, I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, so let's call answer function, whatever that's going to be. And the default is read line. So as far as our application is concerned, the tests don't exist. It's calling read line. We can replace it in our tests. But otherwise, it's completely invisible. It's a really nice way of working. But now, we can inject a different closure in our tests. We want to say, for example, that um, do our, does our game definitely end, definitely end as soon as we hit question 11. Uh, and we can now do that because we can run through a game without waiting for user input because we can just pass in a different closure for the answer reader. So I'm gonna make a new uh, test called func test game completes at 11th question. Let game equals a new y multiply. Here's the important bit game.answer function equals a closure that returns 556 every time. Now, the maximum we have here is 12, and 12 on the left and right plus a multiply in the middle, so the maximum value is 144. 556 isn't possible in this game. This is an impossible value to work with, so it's safe to use that here. I then say game.start. That will start our game loop repeating, but it'll use our closure return 556 in place of calling read line each time. And so the whole game will complete in a fraction of a second. So we can immediately call afterwards assert equal game.question number should be 11. It's hit 11, the game's terminated correctly. And the game.score will see that in here as well. That should be zero uh, because that cannot be the right answer. It just can't be possible. So in theory, this should pass first time. Let's find out. Uh oh, it's failed. Oh, did I miss an equals off my, my thing? Maybe I did. Less than, oh, less than all equals. Let's do 10 questions. Whew. Less than all equals. Try again. Go and test. Boom, it passes. So we've taken our code, which is one monolithic start method, broken up into a few different things, having you know uh, some computed properties on a new struct called question. We've got string and answer with an extension on that. So we keep memorized initializer as well. Uh, we added a, we took away the hidden dependency on the command line. We took away uh, all the processing stuff. And in doing so, let us write a lot of tests. We've got through one, two, three, four, five, six, six tests. And to be fair, this you could write significantly more than that because you want to have some negative tests as well, you know, it's not equal to whatever. So you know it's gonna work across a number of things. So we've got quite a few tests for a very simple app. But what it means now is, and the ultimate importance of unit tests is, we can go ahead and test out any changes to this code we want to. I can say, you know, let's modify that to that, see what happens. And it will hopefully not pass anymore. Our tests will fail. Let's find out. If they don't fail, you've got a mistake, uh, not enough testing, quite frankly. I will run all tests. I'm adding two to question number now every time. Boom, the tests fail. It's spotted the mistake. It's saying, uh, oops, we expect that to be two after answering one question. So our tests have failed, which is great. So it, it is working correctly, which is fantastic. So this gives us the confidence to do better effectively, to have more, uh, there's a wonderful quote, wonderful quote uh, by John Reed, who's an amazing uh, writer and thinker about testing. Um, he's so friendly too, but anyway, um, they, they, they give us the, the, the braveness to make bold changes to our cold code, to go ahead and just dive in and try something new. Because we know when our tests pass, it's safe. You're not thinking, oh, do I dare ship this? Do I have to noodle around for a while in my actual UI doing it all by hand? When you've got the testing behind you to prove your code is doing what you think it's going to do, then you are truly refactoring rather than just you know modifying your code and refining it. You're saying, I've changed implementation without changing what the output is, and that is what refactoring is. 
Um, so you know we can make bold changes to your code without breaking stuff. So that is 58 minutes. Not bad, quite frankly. I'm, I'm, I've actually hit my time for a change. We've refactored this thing uh, into much nicer code with stacked tests behind it that now catch mistakes in our code. This is a significantly better project, uh, which is great. So that completes the project. Uh, we've looked at just unit testing here. Um, right, in theory, uh, this is actually the kind of thing you would have written using TDD. It's actually a brilliant TDD candidate, this one. Uh, we will do TDD in a future episode, I expect, because it's important and I want to cover it, but it's best done by itself, I think, because it, a lot of folks get alienated very easily on TDD. They think, oh, it's not for me. I'm not going to do it. That's a real shame because it is quite marvelous. Um, but it's not a problem. We'll get through it another time, like in a few weeks. Anyway, that completes the application. If you have questions about what I've coded or questions more generally on testing, now is your time. I would suggest, by the way, I do have a whole book on testing, uh, which is called, cunningly, Testing Swift. Boom, there we go. That uh, book on Testing Swift. Uh, you can see what it covers in here, unit tests, UI tests, TDD, and more. Uh, it's stocked the gills with information on testing. Um, so go and check that out, see what you think. If you have questions though, now is your chance to go and ask. Question from Philippe Cardoso. Is there a best practice around dependency injection via property or constructor? So to clarify for folks, there are a number of different ways you can do dependency injection. The two most popular are constructor injection, which is basically initializers in Swift, um, or property injection. Uh, now, personally, I prefer constructor injection um, because uh, it's harder to forget. I can see it there, stare at me in the code when I create into the objects, the completion pops up saying, do you want to pass in a parameter for this thing? So it's really easy for me to remember to put things in. So if I had a chance, I would use constructor injection. In this case though, in this case, it would look ugly because you'd have to have something like, if you were to use constructor injection here for our answer function, would have something like um, uh, start uh, answer function is that. It needs to be a bool, uh, nothing that returns a string optional equals that. That's more or less what you're looking at. Um, and that's ugly. <laughs> it's just ugly. It'd be, it'd be less bad if we could use read line directly. But then you get into this whole mess of having to handle a bool in here, uh, which is fine, but you don't really care about having to say, yes, strip the new lines and so forth. And you've got to add in that, that thing on your other side as well to your test to say you know oh yeah accept some random bull we don't care about in there um so um you could do it uh i wouldn't recommend it just because it's a bit ugly um so in this particular case I, I think property injection probably works out better good question though because there is a trade-off between the two and personally i prefer using um constructor injection because it's much clearer it reminds me to put things in there uh da -da 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 -da. question from robert de Laurentiis. Uh, hi, Rob. How are you doing? Thank you for coming. You're a regular. I appreciate it. Um, why did I add an explicit init to I multiply? You mean for the, the questions up here? Um, so by default, I want questions in the game to be random. I have a random uh, int, a random int on the right, and then a random operation every single time. The operand's random every time. Um, and uh, it's having an extension like that isolates it away so I get the memberwise initializer plus the random one and the game doesn't have to worry about it. The game just says, give me a random number every time. Whereas the tests will say, inject it by hand with the specific values. So it's much nicer. Um, Robert Ramirez, should testability be a consideration when structuring JSON data? Well, I shouldn't think so. I mean, you'd have to have some pretty nasty JSON data to worry about testability, bluntly. Like really gnarly testing data. Um, so I wouldn't be terribly worried about that. Um, if it's large amounts of JSON, honestly, my main concern would be how well does this thing compress? Um, so, because uh, it's going over the internet all the time, so I really wouldn't want any large and, and making compromise of testability isn't, isn't great. Remember, we're looking at, we're look, we make apps for phones and phones are mobile. You know, that's the nature of these things. So you've got to think, what will 
my user on the train think of my very testable but very chunky JSON. Um, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great priority, bluntly. A question from Vlad. How do I find out these things like adding a struct with initializer will not override the default initializer? Um, well, good question, Vlad. I've got a great book on that. It's called uh, Swift Design Patterns. And that exact thing is right in there, plus many, many other things. Uh, and it'll teach you all that and more. Um, how do I find it out? It is documented. Um, so I, I read the docs thoroughly and ask a lot of questions. And I write a lot of very stupid code and then break it again and then refactor it and break it again and refactor it and so forth until it's not stupid. Um, that's bluntly how I work. I write lots of code. Um, anyway. Um, question from RRL. Would I recommend or like more having an app that's ad-free but to pay for a free app with ads? So I have a few apps myself that... Um, actually look after my wife now. I don't do any work on apps full time if possible anymore um, because I have to have patience anymore. She looks after them for me. Uh, and they were made, I don't know, five years ago. Uh, and they still more than pay for our mortgage, right? With ads, with uh, app sales alone. You know, they pay for this entire house, which is great. Uh, despite being completely unloved. I haven't even done an iPhone 10 port for one of them yet. Anyway, um, so that's great. Um, and I do those from sales of the apps. They're not free with ads. They're just pure app sales. Uh, and I must say that the volume is significantly lower. When you have a free app, which is a freemium app where you sell access to the rest of the app, you'll get significantly more downloads, which you can then convert to be a subscription or an in-app purchase or whatever. Um, so that's a, actually, if I were to do it again, I would absolutely make those both subscriptions so I get recurring income from them. I mean, they still sell a lot, you know, it's like I say, they still pay for our mortgage and so forth, but all those recurring users, and I've got lots of recurring users who bought it once and never again, obviously. I'm not monetizing that. I'm not inclined to support it. That's why she looks after it. I haven't got the patience for that. <laughs> um, it's just not worth it. You know, it's, it's the income's good, but not enough for me to want to actually spend time on it. That makes sense. Uh, Sanjay, I already talked about that particular thing. Have you initialized or instruct? Uh, it does have an initializer, but it's not ideal for use in the game. We want random numbers by default. A uh, question from Linigal. You want to get into more testing. You know, there isn't a lot out there actually on testing in terms of actual reading material. Uh, obviously, my book's out there. Um, so if you've read that already and you want more, I'm not really sure where to go. But by all means, email me. If you think that's something I missed off, by all means, um, email me and I can have a look at adding more stuff to it. Uh, question from ROI, how do I learn to use the developer documentation? I have an article on that. I have an exact article on exactly that, um, which actually someone else can link to it in the chat. Uh, it's called something like how to read Apple documentation or something like that. And it just breaks down how I read it, how I consume it, where do I go for more advanced information, um, just to give you a guidance because it is something you kind of learn and then move on from there and uh, don't think about it again if that makes sense. Uh, Question from Oscar. So how do you test navigation? This is an interesting one. Navigation is a challenging one because you get into UI land and it's an integration test. It's like the ultimate integration test. Um, and in testing Swift, we look at this actually towards the end. How do you rip out the coordinator and replace it with something else? Because of course you can inject a different coordinator to say, did navigation occur? Um, it really depends what you're looking to, to do. If you want to test, did they go to screen from A to B? Probably the easiest way is through snapshot testing. You know, am I now showing a UI view controller B, which should have been A, or even screenshots, whatever. Um, that's the, the most precise way. Now, I know folks who swear by snapshot testing. That's where you screenshot the whole thing and say, does this bitmap match the previous bitmap? Um, and that's fine. But that is not unit test in my eyes. And that, that's a discussion to be had. I know some testing people who will say that is definitely a unit test. It's not for me. That's an integration test, uh, minimum. <laughs> anyway. Chris Stapps, question. Hi, Chris Stapps, how are you doing? I'm really looking forward to seeing the video of your talk, by the way. Chris Stapps is speaking at App Builders about core animation. I think it's his first talk. And he's been to so many events. He's going to give a great talk. I'm sure of it. It's going to be an excellent talk. Um, the question is, what do I think about third-party testing frameworks like Quick and Nimble? So one of the issues I have, Chris Stapps, is that my entire job 
realistically, as you can see behind me, uh, is writing about Apple stuff, Apple frameworks, Apple languages, Apple platforms, and similar uh, Apple tools like Xcode. And so even though I would very much like to switch to Nimble, switch to MVVM, switch to App Code, whatever, switch to other things, I'm fighting a losing battle with my readers, bluntly, because they don't want to learn app code. They don't want to learn quick. They don't want to learn alternative X, Y, Z, and so forth. They want to learn Apple stuff. And I get that. So I, I, I laser target my research, my opinions, my articles, my projects on as much Apple things as possible. Uh, so I'm afraid I have literally no opinions on quick and nimble. Um, I have opinions on Jest, the JavaScript testing framework, but that is probably isn't terribly interesting here. Ah, questions here. Best way to get a job as a Swift dev from Yardman. Um, I have a whole article on that. Again, um, someone could perhaps link that for me because I'm being terribly lazy. Uh, I have a whole job. It's one of the earliest ones, actually, how to get a job as an iOS developer. It's really, really early in the uh, Hacking with Swift um, stuff. Hacking with Swift iOS developer job. Actually, no, forget that. I've got a whole URL for this now. Um, Hackingonswift.com slash career dash guide. Boom. That thing. That's my Swift career guide. And this thing um, walks you through all my tests I have. Be the compiler. My glossary. What's new in Swift. My full knowledge base. My objective C cheat sheet and so forth. Then loads of coding tests. Then all my interview questions. Then my core skills guidance. You know, refactoring view controllers, working with GitHub, adding SwiftLint and so forth. More questions there. Then career advice, how to learn, how to get a job, how to deliver a talk, how to get past your interview and so forth. There's stacks and stacks there all about um, getting jobs as an iOS developer. So if you want to know uh, how to get a job, how to learn, how to pass interviews and so forth, um, start there. That, that's it's pretty, pretty big. There's, there's, there's weeks and weeks of reading in that, that link alone if you go follow the links inside there. Uh, question from Ein Uh What if Apple starts tanking? Will I switch to Android lol? <laughs> um, so like I said last time, um, I have written Android apps before. I've written stacks of Android code before. Uh, I've, I've written three, at least three, large apps for Android in Java, actually, not Cotton, I'm afraid. Um, so I could switch to Android. I just really wouldn't want to <laughs> because I didn't like it very much. You know, we had to do some pretty serious um, Android coding. And one of the problems we faced was again and again and again, we'd get like, you know, uh, uh, Google Nexus or, you know, Android, uh, Samsung device out. And go, yes, it works great on the Samsung Galaxy, whatever. Um, but on this horrible... $20 um, MIPS CPU thing we got for nothing at all from Amazon, it doesn't work at all. Uh, and optimize, 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 and so forth. Because um, not many folks, even though the Samsung Galaxies are very powerful devices and the Pixels and so forth are very powerful, most folks don't have them. They have the cheaper Android devices. That's why they're on Android. Um, so you've got to test across a very wide range of devices and they just behave so very differently. Amber Traffic's a bug on the hideous, hideous Amazon Kindle Fire device, uh, which would show black for our web views. Just just blackness. Big hole in our canvas for web views. That was an absolute joy to work with. Loved it. So hopefully, Apple does not tank. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be very, very sad indeed. Uh, ROL, what books do I recommend to a beginner? I recommend you go to hackingwithswift.com slash 100. It is the 100 days of Swift right now. We're on day 10, I think, right now. It guides you through... Learning Swift, uh, in a few days I'll switch across to learning iOS. Uh, it's all free. There are lots of tests in there. There are some videos too. So go and check that if you want to learn Swift from absolute beginner's perspective. Sanjay, is multithreading very important in iOS apps? Yes, it is. Full stop. Um, and, and don't be wrong, you know, don't, 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 you know, dive in with GCD straight away. If you don't need to do it, don't do it. Um, because your average CPU power nowadays, you know, the Apple uh, A10 series and similar, is very, very high. And they're remarkably powerful devices. But this thing, you know, the, the 10s Max has um, three high-performance cores, three low-performance cores. It's a very, very powerful device. 
And if you are using only one of the high performance cores, you are missing out on two thirds of the performance. You could do a lot more with that. So uh, there is a very good argument for learning GCD, multi-threading, very competently. Uh, Alan Hughes, would I recommend learning Objective-C as well? Uh, it depends on the company. Um, you know, I, I'll be honest that most large code bases are still like half Objective-C, uh, if not more, like the serious ones, um, because going to Swift is tricky. Um, it is tricky. It's tricky that people realize. I know you call the same APIs. I know they sort of interoperate to some degree, um, but it is tricky still because um, you've got to mark up your Objective-C very, very well to get the most out of it, make it really clear what's going on. Um, so it's problematic. Uh, so I understand why folks move to Swift fairly slowly, um, but uh, I wouldn't necessarily say learn it now. If you are if you are thinking, I'm learning Swift, should I also learn Objective C? The answer is probably no. Um, if you have learned Swift, like you are already a Swift master, then fine, Objective C. Um, but otherwise, you know, by the time you get around to it, which is like a year or so, if you've really mastered Swift. It's probably a bit, bit dead by that point. Even even the slow movers are trying to move across by that point. Because Swift 5 is really going to put a nice line in the sand. It's ABI stable now. The language isn't changing much apart from additively. There's okay, there's one breaking change in 5.0. Um, but it's it's small fry stuff now, which is really nice to see. Um, Emilio, question. I've been trying to test my code more. I have noticed that it kind of forces to make most projects and functions not private. Is that normal? Uh, yeah, it does. It's true. So, you know, private private code should be not tested code. It's private, right? It's, it's internal for a reason. If you're calling a thing which is not exposed by API, you don't care how that works. The fact that it happens to be a method call, I suppose to some inline code, doesn't matter. It's, it's private. Don't try and test it. You only want to try and write tests for public stuff. Um, so it, it, it is... Uh, normal i don't think testing forces you to make it uh not private but if you're the kind of person who sort of does private var by default then yes it would do i tend to leave it as internal and then add private if i'm releasing an api i'd add private everywhere um just to discourage folks from using it carefully <laughs> incorrectly uh question from chris Daps again which ci's are preferred to run unit tests so honestly uh i have done zero um evaluation of CI services. I haven't gone, oh, this one does this, this one does that. Da, 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 da. I've said, huh, I happen to know one of the folks working at Circle CI who has now left, um, Danielle. Um, she's excellent. She's very, very geeky, quite frankly. She's an amazing geek. She works on Fastlane and um, uh, Cocklepods and works on C Circle CI. I'm like, okay, I trust Danielle. She's super smart. I'll use Circle. <laughs> so I use Circle, um, but not because it's somehow the best. I just it's it's the default for me. It's like Circle. She's smart. I'll use what she does. So easy enough. Uh, question: Have I ever developed a Node, or do I just develop in Swift? I don't think I've ever done Node. No, I have never done Node. I'm not. not, not, not no, that's not exactly true. Um, so <laughs> um, I have. So I used to do. My books, when you buy my books, you'd get uh, a, a um, Kindle edition of the book with your purchase. That was it. And that's because HTML, right? And I modified it so you'd get an EPUB as well. Uh, and then what I thought would be a good idea would be to modify my thing even further so it did um, PDFs. Uh, and uh, my evil hack at the time, so then going, you know, it's like it's 1 a.m. <laughs> I want to get PDFs out of this very quickly. I wrote a very simple piece of node to take all my HTML uh, and highlight it as part of my PDF uh, output chain. And unsurprisingly, <laughs> who knew? The hacky job I did in a few minutes is still there today, several years on. So yes, I have technically written a little bit of node, but not much. But I have written stacks of other stuff. And, and you know, I, it's not just developing Swift. I've written lots and lots of C Sharp. I mean, hundreds of thousands of lines of C Sharp. I've written twice that of PHP. Uh, I've written C++, C. I've written Object Pascal, Delphi. Delphi, yay. Um, you know, I'm, I'm old school, right? You can see I have a t-shirt. <laughs> I've got an Amiga t-shirt on. You can see I'm old school. 
Um, I don't just do Swift. I've done stacks of Java. Crikey, I've done all sorts of things. I'm an equal opportunity love giver for languages. I believe they all have their own advantages. I've written stacks of Python. I mean, there's, there's something to like in all these things. Just try them out. Don't become like a fanboy or a fangirl and just stick on one thing. Uh, ROL is 100 days mainly iOS or just Swift. From day 16 onwards, it becomes iOS. But um, before then, it's just Swift. Get the fundamentals down right first, and then we'll go into iOS big time from there onwards. Uh, <laughs> yes, Rob, you are one of the crowd. <laughs> um, question from Philippe. Uh, will I be at Dub Dub? I have no idea. I have no idea. I'd love to be. I'll, I'll be in the um, lottery. Uh, I'll enter it. Uh, I'll be in San Jose for sure. Um, you know, I, I'm going out there. I booked my hotel already, actually. Um, so I'll be there for the right times. Um, will I actually be at the conference or not? I've got no idea. We will see in, you know, not long now, actually. I expect about four to six weeks we will see uh, Apple's announcement. So uh, we'll know real soon whether I'm going or not. I hope so. Come on. Come on, Apple people. Let me go to that dub again. It's so much fun. Uh, any more questions? Question from uh, Savvy. Uh, related to your advanced coordinates on iOS, how do you handle an event that can happen at any time and needs to show a specific new view controller? Well, so VoIP is special. That's the my system. But I get what you mean. Like, something happens. Um, so, for example, if you have a an online service where the user can subscribe uh, online and upgrade some premium, whatever, the app should notice that and respond dynamically and say, welcome to premium, premium's great, whatever. Um, so that kind of thing is best done with a notification, quite frankly, because you want to say all parts of my app probably should be able to respond to this. And when that event comes in, they've gone premium or a DM's arrived or I don't know what, something's happened, right? Sending a tweet fails, something global that matters everywhere Whatever's on the screen currently should respond to it and handle it and then move on. So I'll probably use notifications for that. A uh, global system. Uh, RL again. Many questions. Um, do I think it's important to be close to other devs or a dev community? Um, I think it certainly helps when you're learning. Because we're, we've all been in that situation where you're learning about something. Let's say... You're learning a language. Like you're learning Swift, right? You're learning Swift. And you hit some numpty problem. You've made a typo somewhere. But your eyes are tired. Your eyes can't see it. You, you don't, you don't, there's a mistake somewhere in there. You can't see it, right? So um, having someone nearby to say, come on, what what, what terrible mistake have I made here? And they'll go, oh, it's you missed a colon or whatever. It's really helpful. And you feel less alone. You learn a lot faster. It's less frustrating. So there are lots of advantages to going to events. Uh, now that could be local ones like meetups. Um, there are lots of those. There's one near me actually that I was there um, a few weeks ago. Um, there are of course uh, conferences to go to. There's lots of those in our community to go to. Again, I have an article on that for 2019 to look at stuff. Um, so go to one of them, meetups or events. And if you're not that kind of person, if, you, if you're not social, fine, don't go. But come to, come to my Slack. Talk on my Slack. I've got a Slack you can come to. Ask questions there. There's actually a 100 Days of Swift uh, channel on there. So if you're doing the 100 Days challenge, you can join the channel and ask questions there. Uh, it's a great way. If you know, people, you know, some of my questions are sneaky, right? And you'll you'll sound learn why on day uh, 12 or so. Um, and people say, "What's wrong with this code? It looks fine to me." And then people say, "Oh, the problem is da 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 da." Um, so if you want to join the Slack and join the 100 Days of Swift challenge channel, it would be uh, helpful. Anyway, MacLover, is there a danger of too many unit tests that can ca cause more trouble than they are worth? Hmm. Yes, of course. Um, in September, I was speaking to this company, which I'm not going to name, um, who have, I think, 6,000 unit tests. I forget how many it was. It's between six and... 55 and 7, I think 6. Unit tests, a lot of unit tests, basically. And uh, it takes them 
25 minutes to run their unit test suite on a MacBook Pro. And when a new person joined the team, they went, oh, you know, the, the MacBook Pro is too big and heavy for me. I want a MacBook Air. Okay, fine. You can, you can have MacBook Air. The tests will never run. I mean, they're going to just come smoke your CPU. Um, so, yes, of course, there is a massive case for too many tests. The problem is that more often than not, you'll find companies go to great lengths to do code review on their production code. They'll go through code review in GitHub, for example, or perhaps pairing or in meetings maybe, but they won't do the same thing for their tests. They just add more tests, add more tests, add more tests, and hope for the best. And they don't go back and refactor those tests or think, well, you know, we use generics in our code. Why not make these tests generic? We'd have one test for, uh, you know, collapse these 10 into one maybe. Who knows? You don't do that. So tests are poorly maintained, that's for sure. That's a real shame. So yes, there's a massive case for you've got too many tests at this point. Uh, scale it back and see where it gets you. <sighs> Question from Sanjay. What is the most important, most, most followed pattern right now? What pattern should I follow currently? Um, most followed pattern. I guess you mean sort of, sort of system architecture, MVC, MVVM, whatever. Um, in iOS, it is undoubtedly... Apple's warped version of MVC, which is basically MVP, um, that's the most followed by far. I mean, I'm not saying it's best. I, I suspect that if MVVM were a template built into Xcode, we would always MVVM. Um, but it isn't, so we don't. We always MVC MV, uh, instead, MVP. Um, so at this point, it's MVC because it's the de facto standard. Now, if Apple change that mind in the future to add something new, maybe a new UI kit or UX kit or UI kit 2.0 or whatever it is, then uh, that might change. Until then, it is MVC or it's Apple's weird version of it. Uh, for that, you want to read about Swift design patterns. Uh, name of the Slack channel. Good question. I'm going to go ahead and copy the invite link from the Slack channel. Invite people. I'll press share invite link. Copy that URL. Paste it into the chat channel. Boom. That is the uh, invite link for the Slack. So you want to come in there, you can join the channel hash 100 to join the 100 Days of Swift channel. And if you have problems, ask them there. There's also channels for um, iOS or macOS or whatever inside there if you want to join those as well. So uh, question for Alan. How is locking functionality done in an app before paying for a sub? Uh, so effectively, when you handle in-app purchases, it's not brilliant, to be fair. Apple's um, subsystem is substandard. <laughs> um, you need a third-party service ready to handle subs properly. Um, but the way it works is you get a receipt back saying they've bought on this date this thing. And you can check that and say, fine, unlock stuff. Uh, Ideally, you don't check the receipt every single time. You just check it once and write a boolean somewhere. But you can check it every time you want to. It's not really a problem. But then you say, you know, oh, this thing, uh, if um, if unlocked is true, then unlock this great feature. Otherwise, or, you know, show the view controller. Otherwise, show an alert. Um, and that's a great use for coordinates, by the way, is handling purchasing or not. Because you can you can swap out coordinates. You can say, you know, before sub coordinator, show alert, show alert, show alert, show alert, so forth. Unlocked coordinator goes in. Do stuff, do stuff, do stuff, do stuff, do stuff. So you're going to split if you change one line of code to unlock all new behaviors uh, using coordinators. Very nice use for that, by the way. Uh, da -da -da. Question from Ahmed. Oh, question from Kambir. What's the best way to start testing a large project that currently has no tests? So that's covered in testing Swift um, towards the end. But the easiest approach to get you started, the sort of TLDR version, is uh, bugs. When a bug report comes in, when I type 38 into the app, it always works. Give me correct rather than wrong. No matter what the question is, I get 38, type it in, it works for our multiplying thing. The first thing you do is write a test showing that the behavior is wrong. It should be 40, but 38 works. Test will fail because it's not correct. You then go ahead and fix the bug until a test passes, 
and eventually it will pass because it, it should do, you know, the correct answer. And then you've not only fixed the bug, but you've added a test to your code to stop that bug happening again, to avoid regressions in the future. And you have your first test. And there's a brilliant quote from Graham Lee, which I added. He's another fantastic uh, testing chap, by the way. Um, uh, so he has this great quote saying, you know, going from zero tests to one test is an infinite improvement. Um, so it's true, you know, you start with one bug, then another bug, then another bug. And of course, we're fixing bugs every day, right? So after two weeks across a team of 10, you've got 100 bugs as 100 tests written. That's your proof that it's, it's better and better and better, which is great. Uh, question from Pablo. I've heard about mocking and stubbing with unit testing. Can I talk about their importance and use cases? So again, this is in testing Swift. Um, very thoroughly, we look at all the options here. What it comes down to is that we have actually used mocking here. Well, sort of. We have our answer function uses read line, uh, which means it will call a system method to read command line input. And that's gonna screw up our code. It forced the whole code to pause while our tests run, and it will test will never finish until that code returns, which it won't do. Probably not running on circle somewhere. So it sucks, right? So we want to take that out and instead use a pretend version instead, which always returns the value immediately. We used, uh, I think it's 556 five, something. Yeah, here, this thing. This is our little uh, replacement function here. Uh, and that means that the read line call no longer happens. And this is used in many, many places, particularly things like um, networking or file system stuff uh, or anything that reads a screen like UI device, uh, UI screen. Um, you know, if you try and read uh, UI device orientation or UI screen scale, you can't know what that value is going to be. You don't want to rely on that value because the scale could be two on a HD device, a retina device, or three on a retina HD device. Sorry, super retina. I lost track of what they're all called these days. Um, two or three, depending on which device it runs on. So it's not an ideal experience, right? You want to, be able to say it's always two. Just, just fake it. And so by providing these fake values, you can say um, always hard code 556. Don't reason the command line. Replace it at runtime to a different version, and it will work. So let's just control the test input much more clearly. They also let us do uh, check that things are called. For example, we, we might say, uh, when the user has bought something, check that we save a receipt. And our saving receipt code, we don't actually run that. We just want to say, set a, a call count to be one higher. So we can say, was save called equal to one afterwards. And that's a, a nice little uh, fake in there, a little mock um, to say, when we call uh, save, was the saving happened at least exactly once? Not at least once, exactly once. Um, so it's a nice replacement there. So we, have, we just test one piece of functionality. What, what folks fall down with unit testing is that they forget what a unit is. We are unit testing, and a unit is one piece of our code. Uh, we want to test one thing at a time. So we don't want to have this question being made inside here. We want to force in this particular value. We want to test that. It's fixed in time. We are testing this thing here, the process call happening. We don't have correct questions of what's inside there. Just do one thing at a time. That is unit testing. Test one unit of code at a time. And this is why snapshotting, doing a whole screenshot, really isn't a great unit test because it has to launch the whole application. It's everything happening together shows a view controller. Fine. That's an integration test. That's a level beyond unit testing in the sort of you uh, unit testing pyramid. Uh, questions, 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 questions. So Matt wants to understand. Uh, yeah, there's nothing on my screen really. There's nothing. I'm showing Xcode again and again. Yeah, I mean, don't worry about it. Question from Matt. Um, okay, I'll, I'll show the screen. Okay, <laughs> see what we're looking at. Where are we? Full screen plus me. Oops, there we go. It's nothing really. It's just thing we had before. Anyway. Ah, uh, question from Matt. How to limit the amount of test code enters my production code. What the main problem people hit with this is that to do good mocking usually means using protocols. 
you know, if you have a a call to uiapplication.share.open some URL, da -da 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 -da, um, the only way of testing that, to remove that dependency and pull it out and put something else in, is using protocols. Because you can't subclass UI application. Creating one of those things uh, will cause your app to crash immediately. You can't create UI application subclasses. You can't do it. It doesn't work. So you've got to create a protocol, like URL opening or something, right, over here, uh, which you can make UI application conform to and make your custom struct conform to, and that protocol then goes into your code. So you are kind of polluting your production code with testing the entire time. That is effectively unavoidable. Other things, you can subclass. So you can subclass, say, uh, a UI screen if you desperately want to, or other things you're you want to you know, mock out, for example. That works fine. Uh, in other instances, like networking, I've got a great article on how to do networking using URL protocol. You can do uh, custom injection of handling there and so forth. So you know, limiting your pollution, I agree, is important, but it is definitely inevitable. Um, so it's, you can't really avoid it, I'm afraid. Question from Kambir, the difference between integration, integration tests and smoke tests. Um, the difference is that a smoke test is effectively, does this application do the least it needs to do in order to ship? So if I were writing Spotify, can I launch the app and play songs from my playlist? That's the smoke test. Because, you know, for a large application like Spotify, Spotify is a huge application. I know it seems small, but it's massive. It does all sorts of things in the background, including, you know, CarPlay and similar. Um, there's a lot of work there. You can't run all those tests all the time. So you normally cherry pick your tests uh, and run CI in the background and so forth. A smoke test is basically just do the absolute minimum required to check this thing works and get it out there. So it's like the a limited testing path effectively. Uh, and sorry, integration test is basically a collection of tests put together. So when I do X with a Y, does a Z happen? As opposed to one simple small thing, it's five things at once, for example. Please answer my question about ARKit. Um, well, it's, it's great you want to learn. I love ARKit in its own way. There isn't necessarily a use for it just yet. I thought see Apple glasses, but maybe this year. Um, so I, I cover ARKit in actually two of my books, uh, Advanced iOS Volume 2 and Practical iOS 12. They cover a variety of things about ARKit, including, uh, I think, four projects. I think I think four ARKit projects are in there. So if you want to learn ARKit, that could be a good place to start. Um, any more questions? I'm going to scroll up and try and find some more questions. Da -da 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 -da. Slack stuff. I think I got through all of them. Did I get through all of them? I think I got through all of them. If I have missed something, go ahead and ask now. I'll get to it as fast as I can. <laughs> what do I think is the coolest app for iOS? Uh, yeah, I have no idea. Uh, I quite like my banking app. My banking app is very nice. Um, but only because it does what I want to do in a very quick way. I think the Airbnb app is very nice. Uh, yeah, let's go open source. I like GitHawk. GitHawk from uh, Ryan uh, is uh, very good. Nice app. I like that. Um, other cool apps. It's, it's problematic because I use my phone a lot. I don't really want to rely on cool apps. I want to rely on useful apps that do things quickly and easily and fast. That's what I care about, really. Uh, so I, I veer away from shiny stuff and stick with uh, cool apps. Well, I would say I got a great recommendation from Ash Furrow recently, um, Headspace, for doing meditation. Uh, and that is actually a really beautiful app. I have, I've, I've, I'm trying calm at the same time for doing meditation. Uh, and their onboarding experience in uh, Headspace is beautiful. I recommend it. Just just out of curiosity. So if you want to delete that app, it's fine. If you don't care about meditation, fine. But at least try their onboarding experience because it's really, really nice. Ooh, I've got some money. Thank you very much, David. 
Was that attached to a question or just because you like... Oh, for the wine. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind of you. Is there a book of me which can complete my AR kit? Uh, no, there is not. I've, I've written no book about AR kit, only that, because uh, I think it's important, it's interesting, but I wouldn't want to do a whole book on it just yet. You know, the books I've written, iOS 12 and Volume 2 of, of Advanced iOS, do cover, I think I think it's four projects of AR kit, I think, from memory. There's lots in there already, uh, including some games, including an art gallery thing, uh, including a nice geolocation thing. There's lots in there already, so I don't plan to do more until Apple announced ARKit 3 or Apple Glasses or who knows what. Um, Polyorthetics, I guess. Um, have you written articles about tests in Swift? I have. I have. Uh, I did one, I believe, on... Um, Hacking Swift read 38, I think. No, 39, sorry. Overview. This one here covers unit testing from scratch uh, in Swift using um, UI kit. So we're testing things there. There's performance tests in there. There might be UI tests in there. There is. It was the end. Here you go. Unit testing in there as well. So there's UI testing in there. So it's a bit of a mix of stuff. It's a real sort of light overview of the code. And I did actually write, um, if you look up Hacking with Swift, Swift Lint. I uh, wrote this little series on making your code better. And um, one of these is how to refactor your app into testing stuff. So you can see it goes through, here's an app you can download. And you know over these sort of um, six articles, we refine it over time. But uh, here's, the, here's the initial project. It's problematic because all sorts of code here, how do we pull that apart to make it more testable? And it runs through, pull it all apart. And then it goes from there into, and now let's put that into... CocoaPods and SwiftLint and Fastlane and Circle and GitHub and so forth. So it sort of walks through a number of things, make the whole code better every time. <sighs> Matt Glover, um, is it good to use uh, a testing environment variable? Yes, it is. Um, so I've been talking to uh, one of my friends about this recently um, because she was talking to me about her way of um, replacing uh, the environment at runtime. We're just backing and forwarding what, what I do and what she does and so forth. Because there are a number of options here. I can't get on the simple option of um, when my environment variable is set to test mode, I will just replace the whole um, environment in my app delegate. She actually goes one level lower. I think she replaces the whole app delegate with a different thing at, at runtime, which is fine too. But there's a number of interesting ways of doing it. But yes, I do recommend using an environment variable. And I, I'm actually a bit surprised that Xcode doesn't give us one by default because we do get debug by default, but not testing, which is a real shame. <sighs> Any more questions? Da, 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 da. Do I plan to cover DevOps topics like writing scripts and Ruby? No. <laughs> uh, unless you want to go to Ruby on Rondays. Uh, this is Swift on Sundays, so there'll be no Ruby here, I suspect. And I guess we'll do... Uh, did we use pods previously? I think we might use pods in a previous project, maybe. I don't remember. Um, but we'll open up a pod file, add one line to a pod, maybe sometimes, but broadly, no. There'll be very little Ruby around, I'm afraid. Uh, tab bar controller or burger menu. Easy. Tab bar controller. Don't use burger menus on iOS. Never use those things. Can I explain schemes? Not not easily, no. <laughs> it is uh, quarter to eight now, so no, I can't explain schemes in a few minutes, I'm afraid. Um, there is a book... Uh, called Xcode Treasure. That's true. It's by Chris Adamson, who is invalid name on Twitter. Uh, he now works for Apple. Um, that's how good his book was, by the way. You know it's good when they hire you after you write the book because it's like, you're that good. Uh, and it's a good book. I bought that book. Um, I recommend it. It's from Prag Prog, the pragmatic programmers. Uh, ROL, what to do after 100 days of code? So as you'll see, and I don't want to give you spoilers here, 100 days of code... Um, I kind of run out of time towards the end. You know, I, I, I want to space things out, so it's basically one hour a day. And you can't get through my material in 100 days, my free material. You can't do it. So I, I can't go, okay, 100 days are finished. Um, <laughs> as, an, as an extension, <laughs> um, if you have some more time on your hands, here's where you want to go next. And I sort of lay out my suggested sort of, I think a day 130 is something I got to. Um, I, won't, I probably won't do day by day at that point. I'll probably post one final article saying, here's the rest of the day, so if you want to carry on going. Um, but uh, yeah, 
But the, if you if you if you like what you're learning, I highly recommend another book I've written. Uh, sorry, I told about it. it's not a sales pitch. Sorry, <laughs> um, this book I wrote called Pro Swift uh, because this thing is the tagline is something like you know uh, break out of beginner Swift because so many folks I meet just write Swift like it's any other language. They write it like a bit of C or write it like it's C sharp or whatever. Whatever they've learned previously, they kind of port over to Swift. And that isn't great. So ProSwift teaches you things like all the idiomatic ways of writing Swift, like pop, like functional stuff, to write better Swift. And it's, it's got something like six hours of videos in there. So check it out. Book and video course, it's a, it's a bargain. But it's, it's designed to take you beyond in your Swift. So I recommend that if you want to go further after 100 days. Uh, question from Niall. Are there any topics I, within Swift I struggle with? Absolutely. Uh, and you know, I've said in the past on uh, Swift on Sundays at most of my workshops, um, I am very happy, very happy talking about the things I don't know because there are stacks of things I don't know. Uh, and I have no problem talking about those because it's important, you know, setting the right tone. I am not somehow some epic Swift genius who knows everything in Swift ever, all of iOS, all of macOS, all of TOS and so forth. There are stacks of things I struggle with every day uh, and that's just normal. So yes, it's it's normal. Question from Hitendra, storyboards or programmatic layouts? Uh, I prefer storyboards because uh, they let me see at a glance exactly how it's going to look. And I can, I can go ahead and design in storyboards. I can have the Assistant editor opens saying, here's how it looks in iPhone 6, how it looks in iPad portrait, whatever it is, simultaneously, uh, and never press build and run. I can just go ahead and design it while watching all the layouts adapt simultaneously exactly how it looks, which is great. Question from ROL, do I host any meetups? No, I don't, but, 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 it is almost certain at this point that 2019, this year, I will run my own conference in the UK. Uh, so if you want to come to a UK where you are most welcome, uh, you know, if you don't know anybody, trust me, you know me. <laughs> You've come to my Sunday's events now. There'll be one in the UK this year, all being well, uh, after Dub Dub sometime, and you are welcome to come to that. That'd be great. <sighs> Do I have any material on RX Swift? No, I don't. Sorry. Uh, do I deal with imposter syndrome myself? And how commonly have I seen it? It's a good question. It's an important question. Um, I suspect I am not terribly ordinary in this respect. Because, in this respect, because I, I do spend literally all day noodling around with Swift. That's my job. Where other folks have to do code review, fixing iOS 10 bugs, porting Swift 3.2 code to Swift file, whatever. There's stacks of general development work I don't have to do anymore. I used to manage a team of people. I have to do one-to-ones and so forth. I have not got to do that anymore. I spent all my day noodling around with Swift. So I feel very confident in my Swift skills, perhaps more so than the average person. Um, I would say that when I get into the really interesting areas of Swift, like, you know, what's supposed to happen here? Should this be quite correct or not? Yeah, of course I'm thinking, does this seem right? I'm not very sure. Um, and I'll usually ask somebody. I'll ask someone else. I'll bounce off saying, does this, this smell good to you? Or, or is this a reek of disaster in the wings here? Um, so I don't personally get imposter syndrome, but I do spend a lot of time throwing code at Xcode and seeing what comes out, basically. That's what I do. That's my writing process. Um, I do see it occur very often to the point where it's not really imposter syndrome anymore. It's just, it's just called being human. You know, we all go through the same thing. Um, when you get on stage to say something about UI, cable view, whatever, you URL session, doesn't matter what, you hopefully have done your homework enough that you fully know it. You know, Chris Apps is going to give his talk on core animation soon uh, about taming core animation, which is going to be a great talk, hopefully. But in order for that talk to work, he's going to have to go through all his material on core animation, 
you know, I don't know what he's been doing. Let's say it's CA shape layer or CA gradient layer, or whatever. Da -da -da -da. And then he's had to go around all the peripheral material that is not in the talk. Like this bit's in the talk, master this, 100% master this. But also this things that aren't in the talk because they will also affect how people receive the talk or the questions they ask about the talk and similar. Um, so you want to make sure when they say, and now it's time for questions, you aren't there sort of sweating, right? You want to be too prepared. So the nature of getting on stage or the nature of writing a book is that you do more than necessary in order to master a topic. I think that it goes a long way to helping imposter syndrome because by the time you've mastered all the sort of peripheral stuff around a topic, the basics, what is CA gradient layer? How do you use UI view around a shape layer and similar? Becomes trivial because you're beyond that now. You've moved to the next level and you might doubt the peripherals a little bit, but you, you really get the core at that point. So I don't tend to feel it too much because I'm always pushing the boundaries. Um, but it's it's a normal thing, I think. I think it's a fairly human experience. Yes, a conference by me is a great reason to come to the UK. You can come and see some... It won't be in London, by the way. It'll be out, outside of London. So we have to uh, see part of the UK you haven't seen before, hopefully. Should be nice. Okay. It is now uh, 10 minutes to 8. If you have more questions, uh, bring it in now, please. Otherwise, uh, I will see you on Twitter. I am Two Straws on Twitter. Uh, question from Felix. Uh, yeah, so you go to pragprog.com and search for Xcode. You'll see Chris Adamson's book, Xcode Treasures. I bought this um, during the um, um, Black Friday sales last year. Uh, it was not $50. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, buy the ebook. Recommend that. It's a, it's a good book. He goes over a lot of Xcode because, you know, it's a huge, huge piece of software. And I did these videos um, recently about the Xcode in 20 seconds. Each one lasts in 20 seconds, obviously. And there's 40 videos in there going through 40 things. A lot of folks hadn't heard of these things. And this book goes over that 